Welcome and well met. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the manager of the Kwonset Garage. Since we've had a rather dramatic negative increase in population, there haven't been many historians on the island, so I've taken upon myself to put together some videos for visitors. They will be available at the Bear Island Tourist Kiosk, so I hope you will find them useful. You might be asking, will I be starting off with a background video about Bear Island itself, or perhaps an explanation of what exactly the Long Dark is? No, because that's boring. Instead, we're going to jump right into the middle and start where most new visitors truly begin their stories, specifically the Trapper's Homestead. If you don't start there, many players will move heaven and earth to wind up there as quickly as possible. It is considered by most to be the best starting base for any run through the long dark. The majority of episode 2 of the story mode deals with going to or coming from the Trapper's Homestead, and many of the one-off challenges involves the Trapper's Homestead as well. In fact, even the menu idle screen is a picture of the Trapper's Homestead, although admittedly a earlier iteration. Often referred to as simply the Trappers, it has become so well known by players of the Long Dark that almost everyone who's played the game for any meaningful length of time knows exactly where it is. Now you can't have a discussion about the Trappers without talking about its primary occupant, Jeremiah. But we're only going to touch on him tangically at this point. Uh, Jeremiah is a rather complicated character, and I want to save him for his very own lore video, uh, specifically after Episode 3 comes out. Uh, that's when I'll be tackling most of the individual character lore videos. I believe there will be more to be learned about him at that time. So instead, we're going to focus on the building and its surrounding area. We're going to be looking to uh, what you can find there. What little we can figure out about its history also raise a very interesting and controversial question. Now you may ask, what is that question? In good time, in good time. Frankly, I need something to keep you hooked. Now the Trapper's Homestead is accessible in the bottom left corner of the Mystery Lake map. There is an open patch of ground directly below Trapper's Homestead, giving you a tactical advantage of the high ground. The interior of Trapper's Homestead is filled with valuable supplies. It contains a bed, a wood stove, a workbench, and many containers including a safe. Here's a list of those containers, although not all of them generate on every run. First aid box, drawer, locker, none to two metal containers, usually at least one under the bed, plastic container, a save. Sometimes you do not generate the uh, backpack that appears on the chair. Here we have a time lapse of the looting of the interior of the Trapper's homestead. I will be doing these for every location video. I'll be dropping the vast majority of my equipment before I do these except for the tools needed to loot, of course, and any clothing that is worn. Then we'll go through the items that I find. Note, I have set this current custom game on a level even easier than Pilgrim. So you should expect this to be the absolute best level of loot that one could find. Expect it normally to be less. Far, far less. As a summary of other runs on this location, I have taken the liberty to kind of consolidate them, and frankly we have a rather wide distribution of total loot. Eliminating duplications, we have antibiotics, antiseptics, bandages, water painkillers, water purification tablets, that sort of thing. The assortment of clothes does seem to be kind of varied, for oddly enough, uh, I came up with wool mittens multiple times as well as insulated boots. I have in the past known that I have come up with other items, but apparently none of those generated on the three passes through. Bullets, of course, can opener, charcoal available in the stove, knife, rifle cleaning kit, sewing kits, skill book snares. The snare always seems to appear on the crafting table. It's almost always there, although I have on one run in uh, Interloper, remember, I did not find it there, which was kind of shocking to me. Uh, of course, the food assortment is the usual randomness from beef jerky to soda. A military-grade MRE does appear there with some regularity, not an extreme amount of regularity, but almost always you can also find either herbal tea or coffee. As for burnables, uh, there's of course the accelerant, occasional book, cedar and fir, newspapers. Tender plugs, yes, those do occur. Uh, however, uh, and if you're lucky, you can find some matches. 
But specifically, you could find usually somewhere around 40 to 45 reclaimed wood can be gained from the entire interior. A do note, I have never once managed to find a way to destroy that chair. The one that the backpack appears on. It apparently is indestructible, even though you will find a duplicate chair in other locations that you can destroy. This one cannot be destroyed no matter what you do. On top of that, you will usually find some cloth, usually recovered when you destroy the one table. And, and then on the stove, if you're lucky, there's a couple of cooking utensils that you can reclaim for metal. Also, rare loot does spawn here. Specifically, the rifle is the most common one that everybody comes for. Uh, I have found fire strikers, usually in the metal containers, as well as the incredibly rare spawning of the well-received muckluck. Not a big fan of the muckluck myself. I happen to go all the way to ski boots, but and if I need to, I'll go with insulated boots should I need something lighter that, you know, supports better. But the muckluck is a superior version of the insulated boot with the increased sprint speed. I'm not a big fan of sprint speed. I'm more a big fan of armor and anything that increases my defense against wolf attacks, but that's just a personal preference. Your individual run may vary. Now, in story mode, the items you find are slightly different from anything you'll find in uh, normal open sandbox play. But the items in story mode when you do get to the Trapper's Homestead are unchanging and always the same. I'll be saving that specific spread for the story mode lore video. However, I do want to address at this point, just because I find it so fascinating, the so-called trust system. Now, if you play the story mode, the trust system, where you earn trust by giving items to Jeremiah and lose trust by taking his stuff, well, it's important to note that the stuff in the Trapper's Homestead does indeed, at least according to story mode, belong to Jeremiah, lest he would not lose trust in you if you took his stuff. Now, I would like to take a moment to explain that the trust system is completely borked. For example, there is a rabbit hide in his home. If I steal it, I lose 15 trust. But if I then give it to Jeremiah, I gain 25 trust. A net increase of 10 trust for stealing his stuff and then returning it to him. Seriously, it's like some sort of bizarre version of Stockholm Syndrome. But now, of course, this is not as bad as how bad the trust system is borked when it comes to the Grey Mother, but that's for another video. Still, if you find yourself playing the story mode, chop up his furniture, and if you were smart, you'll have at least some cured gut from episode 1. I myself had at least 12 to 14, as I recall. And you could easily make a dozen snares if you did things right. On average, you're going to snag about two rabbits every 12 hours. Since you can get an unlimited amount of water from the infinity fire and food from the bunnies, you only really need about 800 calories to survive a day, assuming you do the eating only before sleeping tactic. Every day you spend there, you can gain about 100 trust. Yes, you lose a few snares, but since the maximum number of snares affected in any 12-hour period is three, if the snares will catch a rabbit, fail to trigger, or break. Given the odds, it'll be a month before you finally get down to only three snares if you start with 12. And two rabbits every 12 hours is a low, comfortable estimate. It is possible to get more than six rabbits in 12 hours if you have a multiple sets of three staggered at six hour intervals. Now, theoretically, you could have 72 snares total with three set up for every hour, which is the minimum unit of sleep. But that's next to impossible to manage as the snare catastrophic failure rate combined with the time it takes to properly harvest all the snared rabbits, well, it just scales to the point of impracticality. Also, if you factor in that you can't gain skills in story mode and the maximum trust score that you can have is 375, frankly, there just isn't any point to that level of rabageddon. Still, if you find yourself with a few metric tons of extra rabbit hides, uh, this basically turns into the ability to purchase and consume whatever you want in Jeremiah's home. You just have to pay him in pelts. I don't understand his fascination with pelts, but hey, I'm not the game designer. Regardless, I think you'll find in story mode that the piles of loot around Jeremiah's home are just a shiny distraction, even at its most difficult. Story mode is fairly kind to the player, and with the infinity fire at the Irish Dwarf's home supplying unlimited heat and water, most of the items in his home are a distraction at best, and a needless burden preventing movement at worst. Side note, why does this guy have pine cones in his beard? Seriously. 
but let us move on to the outside. The Trapper's Cabin is located in the bottom left corner of the Mystery Lake map and is surrounded by oodles of resources. On one side you have Old Man Beard for disinfectant. Among those trees you have rabbits frolicking about, both available for snares and for beating in the head and breaking their neck. See that rock over right there? Well, that's where you put your snares. You can see it from the door when you come around the corner, and it's well inside the invisible rabbit run that you have to put snares within for them to function. Up the middle of this hill over here, we always have a backpack. Well, almost always. Occasionally I have seen it not spawn an interloper, and uh, unfortunately rarely it has anything special in it, but it's worth a gander all the same. Next to it will occasionally spawn a small cluster of birch saplings for the aspiring bow enthusiast. Swinging to our right, we can head down to the nearby barn. Normally, some wood will spawn in there along with a deer carcass. The interior of the barn is outside of the pathing system for any sort of creature that aims to do you harm. You don't even need to go inside the inner area to break the pathfinding algorithm, which is good because you are surrounded by violence. Trivia! If you put your bedroll in the inner area, go to sleep, then, when you wake back up, quit, and restart, you will start the game on the upper level of the bar. It's an odd glitch you can play with in many different locations where there just isn't enough headroom for when you restart the game. But do be careful, Go. I believe on one time when I was experimenting this with an overhanging rock, uh, somehow I managed to bork myself right through the bottom of the map. So, do be careful, because there are some places you should not try this trick. But, uh, I digress. Yes, nice and peaceful deer spawn in the bowl area outside the trapper's homestead, and bunnies will frolic among the old man's beard. And just around the corner, there's another grove where bunnies and deer spawn, along with a bear. This is the bear's cave. It sucks. It's not windproof, although the wind does have to hit a just right angle in order to put a fire out in there. But unlike many other caves, this one does not have a reduction in temperature when you enter it. It does, however, spawn a bear. It will try to murder you. It will do this as hard as it can. Over this hill will spawn two wolves at various locations that who, unfortunately, these wolves will wander close enough to smell you. And over that hill... Uh, there are more deer spawns, and I've seen up to three wolves at one time. Now, all these wolves will try to murder you. They will murder you as hard as they can, but that's not as hard as the bear can murder you. Still, what they lack in quality of murder, they more than make up for in quantity. Depending on your luck, you may also occasionally see a moose spawn in the depression below the trapper's homestead. If you have a weapon, this is a great thing. It's time to get that moose satchel. If you don't have a weapon, well, it's time for you to find out how long it takes to heal some broken ribs. And frankly, depending on your difficulty, all those wolves will smell you the moment you pick up a single shred of raw meat. Assume that if you kill a moose on your doorstep, you are going to need to move fast and build a fire to repel those wolves. Or you're going to need to haul everything inside as quickly as possible because every canine on this quarter of the map is going to come visit the moment you touch that carcass for harvesting. This is why the barn is so important. It's your refuge for the many, many, many beasties that want to sink fangs or occasionally embed hooves into your oh-so-fragile flesh. Still, if you manage to make some arrows, or even better, the trapper has spawned a rifle and some bullets, this is a relatively safe location to base, with the pros vastly outweighing the cons. Personally, I see it as a training ground. Once you get your snare production going, you'll have a steady supply of rabbits to practice your harvesting skills on. If you cut the rabbits into very thin strips, you can level up your cooking skill with great alacrity. If you luck out and find a magnifying glass, you can go outside when the sun is shining and burn sticks to level up your fire building. Or if you've already had a fire going you can, that you just want to run down, grab a torch and make a fire using the torch both as the ignition source and as the fuel. A popular trick is to chase deer into the wolves who come to visit and then shoot the wolf. Now you have a deer and a wolf for only one bullet. Very economical. 
And uh, when it does come time for you to finally wander looking for other supplies. Why, not only is there the rest of the map, but there's a cave nearby that leads to Milton. I'm going to give that cave its very own lore video at some point. Now, over the hill that heads in the direction of the train tracks, and dangerously close to where the wolves like to spawn, is a location that is known as Max's Last Stand. It is here that we can find, presumably, the eponymous Max. He sometimes spawns with a gun, a hatchet, or a backpack. Occasionally he has some insignificant article of clothing on him, but it could be anything a corpse randomly generates, to be honest. The backpack, if it spawns, has been known to have a skill book. But needless to say, this is a randomly generated item and not a given for the location. And uh, finally, we do have two small but not insignificant mentions. First, if you are into hitting rabbits with rocks, most of the rocks can be found in the little cul-de-sac directly below the building. Uh, second, and a bit more important, is that there are four harvestable scrub brush around the trapper's place. Most people miss it because you get used to the fact that almost all the other bushes on this map are decorative. In this case, for a mere 20 minutes by hand, for each individual shrub, you can harvest a total whopping 28 sticks. That's plus 28 heat to a fire, 28 practice attempts to increase your fire skill, or just uh, 3 to 4 extra hours of fire that you don't have to go that far to gather. Uh, trust me. Considering the fact that you can walk out of your front door to a bear, wolf, or even a moose almost right on top of you, you might be grateful for an easily accessible source of wood. So that covers the basics inside and outside the location. And next we get to the promised controversial question. Who is the actual owner of the Trapper's Homestead? Uh, Jeremiah, of course, so we're moving on. But wait! Around here, we specialize in taking the most trivial of information and blowing it way out of proportion in an ever-widening spiral of madness and a thinly-veiled attempt at clickbait. Might there be some other explanation? First, let us establish if Jeremiah lives there at all. Well, of course he does. That's his stuff. You lose trust if you steal his stuff. However, that doesn't mean he's the owner of the building. You see, the entire area is the Mystery Lake National Park. It even has fire watch towers, and those are usually staffed by the government forestry service. So how does the Carter Hydroelectric Company get the land they do for their particular project? Eminent domain, obviously. Uh, the government just gave it to them, I suppose. So would it make sense to the government that owns the entire area would buy up everything but not the trapper's cabin? Does that make Jeremiah a squatter, then? Well, not according to my theory. You see, the second part of my theory deals with why does he have that old military radio he keeps in the floorboards of his cabin? You can see it is almost a match for this picture here. What is this radio used for? Is it for sending out messages? Signals? Or could it be a homing beacon, if nothing else? Clearly, he is signaling someone, but why on such an old piece of equipment? Well, because... Jeremiah works for the government as a deep cover operative sent into the area to make friends with forest talkers and possibly to find out information on their leader, who I will go into in another video. We can assume he's been there for years and has not run into any problems regarding property rights because the government is the one who sent him there. In short, Jeremiah may claim it as his own, but in reality he was gifted the building as part of his cover story for a government investigation into eco-terrorism. Going along this train of thought, would they have sent someone like that off alone? Normally that wouldn't be the case. They'd send some sort of backup. And I think they did. Jeremiah's backup was Max. Yes, the dead body at Max's last stand was Jeremiah's partner. How do I know this? Well, given the location and the direction the body is lying face down, one can assume that he had his back up against the tree when he was attacked head-on. Max sometimes generates with a rifle. What do we know that could take a rifle shot and still keep coming? Why the bear that lives in the cave that the body happens to be pointed at? How else do we know that the bear killed him? Well, because Jeremiah calls the bear a man-killer. How would Jeremiah know this? unless he knew that the bear had killed someone. And that someone was Jeremiah's friend and partner, Max. That also explained Jeremiah's obsession with killing the bear. 
Not only was Jeremiah channeling his inner captain, Ahab, but he wanted revenge for the death of his friend and partner. Well, I guess that's just how Irish dwarves with pine cones in their beard roll. Of course, the timing of all this is a little off. There is a possibility that Max's death just occurred, given where we first encounter Jeremiah with the old bear kicking his ass, the Jeremiah may have taken some shots at the old bear as it was killing Max, perhaps. Jeremiah may then have been hoping to make it for the cave for protection and was just a little too slow. Given the angle for where we see Jeremiah when we first exit the cave in episode 2, this is not as far-fetched as it seems. Of course, that raises the question, why doesn't Jeremiah talk about Max? Well, shock most likely. I'm betting he just can't bring himself to admit that Max is dead. I'm reading into this from the reaction that Max had when he gets the old bear's ear. Is he honestly missing the bear? Or maybe, just maybe, he can't bring himself to admit that it is Max he is indeed talking about. Of course, this is all more than likely completely wrong. But hey, you didn't come here to be bored by reality and dry facts. Now, did you? Now... Finally, a bit more serious note, I've had to revise my script because of one of the facts that proved that Jeremiah wasn't the true owner of the Trapper's Homestead has been updated thanks to a very helpful contributor, and I need to explain something. Now, I first noticed that there was a significant difference between the menu screen that shows the Trapper's Homestead and the one you see in the game. I assumed that the differences were just for stylistic purposes or perhaps the map needed to be addressed and changed for some sort of pathing issue. However, looking into it further, I noticed that there were two grave markers in the menu, but three in the game. Looking into it further, we find the only cross-style grave marker that has any writing on it on any map. It has, written vertically, two initials. K-G. Who is K-G? Initially, I thought this was the original owners of the Trapper's Homestead. I was certain that I could find Jeremiah's last name, and it was not G, that that would have been pretty much one more nail in the coffin that Jeremiah was not the owner. I also considered the possibility that this was a joke, a play on words, as it were. The initials KG are also a unit of measurement for kilogram. The original name for kilogram was The Grave, which is, of course, from a derivative from the original unit of Gravette, that the French then later changed to gram, and thus kilogram was born. I thought, in a way, that that was rather funny and quite brilliant. However, that was before some helpful individual sent me a link to a two-year-old post. This is a memorial to one of our developer's brothers that passed away. This explains why it is the only cross with any writing on it. This also explains why there are only two grave markers in the menu screen but three in the game. While my skip tracing skills are strong, and I believe I could indeed find out the actual name of this KG, or at least come up with a reasonable guess, it occurred to me that attempting to track down this particular bit of trivia was just a little too invasive. There are some lines that should not be crossed. There are some barriers that exist for a reason. Instead, I shall merely end the video in a moment of silence for the passing of one who obviously meant a great deal to one of the developers. Via Condias, KG, for being truly the first of us to go into the long dark. Thank you for stopping by the Bear Island Tourist Kiosk. Be sure to stop by the Quonset Garage if you find yourself needing any supplies. Just remember our motto, Quonset Garage, where the water is always free.